And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. Those words of Acts 15, 40 and 41 are only one of several records of the work of the apostles of Jesus, who planted churches, then revisited those Christians to support and increase their growing faith. The word translated confirming means establishing besides, strengthening more, rendering more firm. The record continues in Acts 16.4 to show what they did and what resulted. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. This confirming the church's Bible class focuses on those decrees of the apostles that will help us to grow stronger in faith and service if we learn and apply them. King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. All of his scientists were unable to interpret his dream, all of his philosophers, all of his counselors. And so he was going to kill them all. But Daniel said, wait just a minute. In Daniel chapter 2, verses 27 and following, we read that Daniel answered in the presence of the king, and he said, The secret which the king has demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king, but there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Daniel was bold. He was young, but he was bold with God. He stood in the presence of the king to announce there is a God in heaven. The world in which we live is generally a godless place. Children are taught that there is no God. Oh, maybe not directly, maybe not in those words. But God's righteousness, God's love are not taught to them as answers to life's problems. Murder, rape, theft. Divorce, remarriage, living together without marriage, killing sick and old people, or the very young and unborn that we don't want to care for. The question of God's existence is a practical consideration, not just a spiritual or religious or church question. Teachers and lawmakers speak of right and wrong, but their answers aren't convincing because they aren't linked to any unchanging standard. Their answers are not consistent because they don't recognize that there even is any absolute standard. You see, without God, any attempts to define right and wrong are nothing more than opinions, and opinions vary from one person to another, from one time to another. And children can see that. They know what we're doing. They can recognize the difference between an opinion and a law. And so they learn that opinion is the standard. But opinions, again, are inadequate as a guide for living because immorality continues to increase despite all of our opinions and statements. And opinions are worthless to the soul and its eternal destiny. No man has ever seen eternity and come back to tell us about it. But we profess to control it by our actions, by our decisions here in the physical world. That's illogical. And all of our statements are unprovable when they're based strictly on our own suppositions or wishes. Rejection of the idea of God in the Bible is both illogical and productive of despair and, as we said, increasing morality. Belief in the God who is, that is, acceptance of the existence of God, is both logical and is productive of more good than all the other plans combined. You see, man is more than just flesh and blood. You and I are communicating right now. I'm speaking, you're hearing, you're understanding. Perhaps you're not understanding the words the way I am or the way I intend to, but you're getting some sort of communication. There's more to you than is visible. 
The wise man Solomon wrote, it's in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse number 13. He said, I gave my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail has God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. God gave us a mind to think, to reason, to learn and to understand. God wants us to think. You're thinking right now more than I'm saying. The flesh doesn't think. There's something more about you that's causing that to happen. The mind works faster than rather yeah, the mind works faster than than the than the tongue can, and so there's a lot of thinking that goes on. But the apostle Paul asked this question: What man knows the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? You can't read my mind. I can't read your mind. He goes on to say, the only thing we know about God is what He told us. The only thing we can know about one another is what we're told by that person. And of course, if it's from persons, it may or may not be true. But with God, it's always true. You dream when you sleep. You remember the past. You imagine the future. You have a conscience that polices your thoughts, words, and actions. Paul recognized this again in Romans chapter 2 and verse 15. Speaking of the Gentiles who were doing the law, though it had never actually been taught to them directly, their conscience also bears them witness and their thoughts, meanwhile accusing or excusing one another. We have a conscience that condemns us or approves of our actions, words, and thoughts. You believe that you are more than other people can see. You don't want to be judged by somebody else's opinion. You're not your appearance. You are your thoughts, your experiences, your dreams. You love, you hate, you hurt, you hope. But all of these things are not abilities of the flesh. There's more to man, as the old movie line said, than surgeons can remove. There's something about man that is not physical. And so where did that come from? You see, man's very nature implies the existence of God. Thinking, dreaming, remembering, imagining, reasoning. These things all have some kind of source. Emotions, both pleasant and unpleasant, have a source. Flesh cannot do these things. So flesh can't be the source of these feelings and emotions. There's something non-physical, non-visible that gave existence to that part of you that is non-physical and non-visible and gave you all those abilities, the order, the distinctiveness, the control that is you and you alone. And so the Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 7, love is of God. God is love. And in John chapter 1 and verse 3, without him was not anything made. And Genesis chapter 1, of course, in verse 1, the first sentence in the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We have to deal with these statements because they're made, they're there. How are we going to respond to them? But if we're rational and logical people, our response has to be measured in light of our observations of the real world. And these observations that we've just noticed confirm or coincide with, certainly go hand in hand with, the statements that are made in Scripture. The physical universe itself proclaims the existence of God. In Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2, we read about the order, the system, the predictability of of the universe. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter the speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. What's he saying? It's speaking to us. What season of the year are we in? Does it come around this same time every year? What comes next? How do we know? That orderliness, that system, that that predictability has to come from a mind that has those characteristics about it. God's existence provides us the moral standard that we need in this world. 
the first chapter of Paul's epistle to the church in Rome speaks very clearly and very strongly, very boldly to this whole question about the existence of God. Look in Romans chapter 1, verse number 18 as we begin. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And some people stop right there. That's all they want to know. The wrath of God. Well, I don't need anything to do with any God who isn't a love. Well, we just read that God is love. So what about this wrath, this anger of God? Where does that come from? Look, look further. Paul didn't stop with verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it to them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You see, when people can see the truth and know the truth, and everybody can because day unto day utter speech, night unto night shows knowledge, there's the sun, it rises in the east, it sets in the west on a, on a predictable time scale. Look in your daily newspaper or online or wherever you find such information, it will tell you the minute that the sun is going to rise tomorrow or set tomorrow or next year or next week or any time along the way. How can they know that? That's speaking to us. There's something, there's a message there. It's telling us that there is an orderly organized, all-powerful creator. Paul continued in Romans chapter 1, verse 21, that they knew God, but they imagined vanity in their minds. Look at this. That which, uh, uh, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. As you travel around the world or just study around the world, you can see people worshiping all manner of man-made things or maybe God-made things. But they worship that which is made and not him who made the things. Or sometimes they worship man who made the things that man made, the engraved idols. But they don't worship him who made man. And that's why the wrath of God is revealed against them. Paul continued that they worship what they saw rather than him who made it. Verse 24. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And he goes on to talk about the men doing the same thing, working men with men, working that which is unseemly, describing our very world. People who reject God and God allows them to go wherever they want to go because they've rejected him. And so today, man worships himself. They worship man for his accomplishments, but they can't see worshiping him who accomplished the making of man. Daniel was a young man, and he knew that there's a God in heaven. People who wish that it were not true are teaching our young people and others that it is not true. But wishing doesn't make it so. In anything in life, all the evidence that we have supports the conclusion that Daniel was right. There is a God in heaven. And may he richly bless you. Vainly we seek after men for guiding light Or in dreams for a heavenly call Man of himself cannot set his soul aright, so it's back to the Bible for it all. Back to the Bible, the God-given Bible. 
for grace and duty, great or small. Each one may know what to do and where we go, but it's back to the Bible for it all.